Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well today. My name is Cheryl, and I'm excited to share pictures and history of buildings in my home state of Kentucky with the topic question the narrative in mind. While looking through the videos, I would like for everyone to ponder the possibility that these buildings were founded by the settlers of the land, that these buildings may be much older than we give them credit for being. By looking into the current narrative, we will look at the facts presented and evaluate whether the current narrative is merely created and written by the founders of the land. Each seeker of the truth will have to take what resonates with them and ask themselves, what is the truth? Does this topic have merit? Let's explore the narrative together. On April 10th, 1823, the Kentucky Asylum for the Tuition of the Deaf and Dumb, later changed to Kentucky School for the Deaf, was created by the Kentucky General Assembly. Kentucky School for the Deaf was the first deaf school established west of the Allegheny Mountains and the first to be supported by public funds. The impetus for the establishment of the school came from legislation proposed by Greene County Senator General Elias Barbie, whose 23-year-old daughter Lucy was deaf. The school was located in Danville and the governance of the school was placed in the hands of the Board of Trustees of Center College. Why Center College? There is no official explanation but members of Elias Barbie's family, including his father, John Barbie, lived three miles north of Danville at Stony Point. His brother, Joshua Barbie, another prominent Barbie, owned what is now the Old Crow Inn and lands around it and was a member of the center board. Another prominent board members included Isaac Shelby, Kentucky's first governor, and Ephraim McDowell, a well-known physician. In looking for a faculty, the Board of Trustees turned to Center College and found a young student, John Adamson Jacobs. Jacobs taught and served as principal from 1825 until 1854 and as superintendent from 1835 until 1869. During the Civil War, Confederate forces attempted on three different occasions to take the school over, but Jacobs was steadfast in his defense of the school, its property, and its students. After the third attempt, the Confederates moved on to other parts of the town. The Center College Board of Trustees governed the school until 1870. Then the Kentucky General Assembly established a Board of Commissioners for Oversight, which was in place until 1959 through 1960, when the Kentucky Department of Education took control of the school. By the eve of World War I in 1914, most students traveled to Danville by train. Railroad companies charged reduced fares for students traveling in school in in fall and returning home in the spring. Most years, the Kentucky School for the Deaf was in season for 40 weeks, from the second Wednesday in September until mid-June, except for students who lived nearby. There were no vacation breaks during the school year. Augustus Rogers, a Center College graduate, had become the superintendent in 1896. Rogers said, The object of all education is good citizenship, and judged by this standard, the school has not failed of its mission. From 1885 until 1963, when the school was completely desegregated, there were two separate residential schools on one campus the white school and the colored school. In a typical year, 1914, the white school had 324 students, while the colored school had 27 students. The white school had one supervising teacher, 24 teachers, 10 in the manual department, and 14 in the oral department. The colored school had two teachers. While enrollment at the white school steadily increased, the number of colored students enrolled before 1920 was 60 and over the next decades, their numbers declined rapidly. The school was free to Kentucky residents. In the first quarter of the 20th century, the average annual cost per pupil to the state was 
and $33.33. Trades and academic subjects were taught. Normally, no student younger than eight or over 21 was admitted, and 10 years was the maximum time for a student to remain at KSD. According to Superintendent Rogers, in no case will a child be kept by the school after it is fully ascertained that he can make no further progress in his studies. By 1923, the school's centennial year, Kentucky School for the Deaf had educated over 2,000 students who had become self-supporting citizens in the communities where they had resided. So what do you all think? I was unable to find any construction photos at this time. If anybody has any construction photos, if they would share them at the bottom, that would be much obliged. I would like to thank everyone for their time. Expect more videos to come. Until then, goodbye, peace, light, and love.